seated. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and hold your finger there. We'll get there in a minute. Our Heavenly Father, I ask that you would have your way today among your people. Lord, we have much growing to do. We need great illumination in our hearts and our minds. The dullness, the shaded understanding, Lord, will destroy us if we do not rise above it. Once you said through your inspired word, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of discernment, lack of perception. Father, I pray that all of us want that perception from you and are willing to listen, to pray, to open the door that we could be wrong. I pray that you help us to grow up into you in all things. Jesus name. Amen. Well, with two weddings uh, a month apart, I think it's good to talk about marriage. Key to a God-honoring marriage, the appropriate use of the power of your position or even understanding the appropriate use of your position. We find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Woman wasn't here yet. This is God and man. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. I will make him a helper, one that is fitting for him, one that has all the possibilities of meeting all the help needs that he has, one that is suited to that end, one that is formed for that purpose, one whose greatest accomplishment in life will be that fulfillment. In Ephesians 5, and verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. I've actually heard people say, but verse 21 says, submit one to another. What it's saying is, you, you in the church need to submit one to another according to God's design, and then it goes into articulating God's design. Okay? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, or in Colossians, as it is fitting in the Lord, according to the Lord's design, according to the Lord's boundaries, according to the Lord's ideas. Um, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. In Corinthians it said, the the head of the woman is the man, the head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. I guarantee you, Christ being the head of the church is never contrary to God. Okay? He's always in line with His authority. Uh, therefore, as the church is subject to Christ in that way, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with his own ideas. No. With the washing of the water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And so therefore, whatsoever you would do to others, uh, you want them, uh, you, what you want others to do to you, you do to them. How you would want your wife to treat you, you ought to treat her with the same respect and love. Um, because he that loveth his wife as his own body, okay, when you truly love your wife the way you want to be loved, when you truly give the way you want given to you, you're going to have a peaceful relationship and you're going to be pleased with it. And you're actually loving yourself because it reciprocates. <laughs> and 
by, by being proper to your wife, it comes around and you're actually helping yourself. Um, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of the body of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, a unit uh, of their own. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, there's two different types of positions in this relationship. There's the position of authority, and there's the position of influence. Okay? Now, obviously, the position of authority also bears influence. Um, <clears throat> Ezra, come here. I want you to take this and plug it in over there. Okay? What is this called? Cord it's an extension, extension cord. cord. You know why? Because it extends from the source. So, this has the same power as that, but the cord is never the source. The cord is an extension of the source. Okay? Now, I want you to look at this word here. What is that word? Author. Author. The root word of authority is author authority. Okay? The root word is author. Or you could say source or origin. Okay? So authority means there is a source. You are an extension of the author. Okay? Um, and that's the definition of authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. But that authority must be in line with the author, the originator, the source. And you are simply an extension of that. Now, um, if that cord was only plugged in to one of those slots, would this light come on? Because you're not extending the source. The cord is not the source. The cord does not produce electricity. The cord is an extension of the author. Okay? Now, if I author a book, I'm the author of this book. Okay? Now, this book is not authoritative unless it is an extension of the author. But, as according to law, as the author of this book, if you take what I wrote and use it for your own purposes, what's that called? And no, you don't give credit to the author. You take credit, but you 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 uh, take what I wrote and use it for your own purposes without permission or giving proper credit. Misappropriation. Yeah, it's called plagiarism, right? It's called plagiarism. Now, do you know what the word plagiarism is from the root? From the Latin and Greek roots, it's from the word kidnapper. Plagiarism is kidnapping. Okay? So, you are taking something that's not yours, you're stealing it and using it for your own purposes. It's the same as kidnapping. Because it's not in line with the author. That means that I, as a husband, when I assume authority that is not from the author, I'm a plagiarist. If I'm if I'm saying, well, I'm the husband, you gotta obey me, and I'm basically presuming to have a source of authority here, I'm the authority, but I'm not appropriately extending his authority. The author is not in charge here. I have plagiarized something that he authored, but I'm using it for my own purposes without his permission. I'm kidnapping. Okay? Um, and that's all important to understand. Now, when it comes to 
uh, authority, I am given authority, delegated authority, in order to establish his kingdom in my realm of jurisdiction. Where I have jurisdiction, and I'm in line with the author, I have authority. Okay? If I say, thou shalt not covet, as your father, it's as though God said to you, thou shalt not covet, because I am I'm taking what the author had and giving it to you. This electricity coming out of that cord is the same that comes out of there. Okay? But, if I start altering and changing, then I am not... Uh, it, the delegation becomes an act of criminality in my hands. It's not the power of authority, but the act of a criminal. Now, this matter of influence. There's two words right there. The word influence comes from the word inflow. So we have the influence. Okay, that's where the word came from. So, it's the matter of influence is the inflow and the effect that that inflow has. It's not the power of commanding, but it's the power of altering in the sense of influence. Now, in the power of authority, you have influence. You can't avoid the influence that you express. But those under authority, by the way, everyone under me has the power of influence. Those over me have the power of authority. The authority does influence. But the ones under me don't have the power of authority. They only have the power of influence. Okay? Uh, big brother, when he's delegated by daddy, has the power of authority over little brother. But little brother does not have that power of authority unless daddy sent him to call big brother. Okay? And then that's there's a delegation of authority. Authority is delegated. But the influence there is you, in that situation, being what God has called you to be. And so God is not coming to your authority by way of authority. He's coming to your authority by way of influence. You can have a great influence on those above you. The wife has the power of influence because a good helper is... Helping is influencing, okay, in many different ways. So, no, the helper doesn't command. Adam is tending the garden. Adam got that commission. It's his commission. He will answer to his authority, okay? She does not come in and start telling him how to run the garden. But as a helper, helping in weed pulling, helping in obeying his commands, helping in being an extension of his authority, helping in, in following and, and, and helping him implement his uh, plans and designs under the author, but also the help of ideas, observations, uh, information, and all of this, when she helps, when she obeys her authority with Christ's likeness, it encourages him to obey his authority with Christ's likeness. She will influence him. Period. It's going to happen. Okay? The question is, what kind of influence? The power of influence uh, is not to make your husband what you envision for your security and pride. The power of influence is as a steward to help him reach his potential for God. The power of influence is to encourage him in the Lord. Not accuse, correct, or to, you know, uh, implement your own ideas via him. It's not to embarrass him while saving your own face and venting your own ideas. It's not to be a ball and chain to counter, temper, or balance him according to your perception. It's not to assume to be his judge, his teacher, or caretaker. Okay? You are there to be a helper. A help that is fitting for the man commissioned of God. Jesse said at the wedding, and it was very good, ideally, marriage, when you have a man that's busy for God, and a woman who's coming in to help him. That's the idea. And anything outside the realms of that idea is wrong. The husband being an extension of the author in the garden. The wife coming along to help him in the garden so that he can please the author. 
So his authority should not be used for any other purpose, any other purpose, and her influence should not be used for any other purpose. Otherwise, you become a plagiarist. You become an anarchist. You become a mutineer. Now turn to 1 Samuel 25. I'm going to look at two examples in the Bible that we are familiar with, but I want to compare them. There is, There are volumes of ideas here. First Samuel 25, we have the story of Abigail. And Samuel died, and all Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Manon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Notice how many sheep he had? 3,000. Okay? Uh, and then you'll notice what David is offered, and it is a small price to pay uh, for all that David did. Now the, man, now the name of the man was Nabal, which means folly. Okay? That's, I don't know why he got that name, but uh, that was, was his name. And the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds were with us. Uh, which were with us, we heard them not, neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever come unto thine hand, unto thy servants, and to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all this, those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants, and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not which they be? He knew who his father was, though, didn't he? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about four hundred men and two hundred abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us, both by day and night, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his house. For he is such a son of Belial, that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste, and took two hundred loaves, and two bottles of wine, and five sheep, ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn, and an hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertained to him by morning like any that pisses against the wall. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, my lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my lord, when thou didst send them, when thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath holden, withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as an able. 
And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Then shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. And David, totally taken back by the skill and wisdom of this approach, so much to be learned by every line. That's why the Bible calls her a woman of great understanding. But I want to tell you, she didn't start this in a moment of crisis. This woman of great understanding had grown to this by practice. She had grown to this by seeking God, being a woman that fears God. She had grown to this through the trials and struggles of life and seeking God through it all. She had become skillful. It's unfortunate that she had to be married to a Nabal to help maybe provoke her in that way. God can give it to any woman even if she has a nice husband. But this woman is so has been so skillful in her words and her approach that she saved the lives of all her servants in her household and even her husband who was back home drinking himself very drunk, it says. And David said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice. And blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. Now, turn to 2 Samuel, chapter 6, and verse 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. How would you like to come home to that? And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord, it was before Jehovah, which chose me before thy father and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will be, and I will yet be more vile, or I will abase myself more than thus, and will be based in my own sight. And of the hands of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child under the day of her death. Now, <clears throat> I want to compare these two approaches. <clears throat> On one hand, you have wisdom and humility. On the other hand, you have pride and foolishness. <clears throat> the one approached as the wife of David's enemy, determined to be killed. And she so turned the situation around that he said, Go in peace. Blessed be you, of the, thou of the Lord. Blessed art thou. And when God smote Nabal and killed him, he wanted her to be his wife. She was the wife of Nabal. I mean, this woman coming down, meeting her would-be murderer, someone who's coming to kill her and her family, so skillfully approached the situation that she completely turned it around whereas Michael was David's own wife okay 
And David is in a great mood. He's been bringing the ark into the Lord, dancing and praising God. He comes home not to slay, but to bless. He comes into the house to bless his family. He's in a great mood. And she turns the thing totally around and receives a curse from him. That's two extreme situations. Abigail was in the worst possible circumstances and she turned it around. Michael was in the best possible circumstances and she blew it. Abigail met David when he was acting proud. Michael met David when he was acting humble. Abigail met David. She found David's favor in the worst circumstance. Ab and Michael lost his favor in the best. Abigail was honoring David when David was not acting honorable. Michael was dishonoring David when he was acting honorable. Abigail was keeping David from sin. Michael hindered David in righteousness. Abigail was blessed and exalted. Michael was cursed and humiliated. The same man. It all had to do with the approach. It all had to do. I mean, if Michael had had the humility, wisdom, and skill of Abigail, and David came home in a good mood, she could have made it so much better. But he embarrassed her. He embarrassed her because he was getting excited about God, leaping and dancing before God. And after all, she was Michael, the daughter of a king. She was a king's daughter. And she didn't, she didn't think a king ought to act this way. Where did she learn about how kings act? Her daddy? Was that okay? No. No. So, Michael, it doesn't matter what you think a king ought to do. It matters what God thinks a king ought to do. And you need to keep your mouth shut, Michael. It's not your business. You don't have authority. You stepped out of line, Michael. You should have hummed. If you didn't feel like it was right, you should have had the power of influence in a godly way. But you were not influencing in a godly way, Michael. And God turned it back on your own head. Bad deal. Abigail was caught up in what was appropriate for her to do in her position at this crucial time according to God. Would Nabal call her wise? No. But she saved his foolish life. Okay? He was back drinking himself drunk. He would have been killed with all the servants in the household, and David would have taken the spoil. And he would have lived to look back in regret before God. Abigail, the servants came to her and said, Abigail, you got to do something. This is bad. And nobody can talk to Nabal. He's over there. He's going to be getting drunk. He's not going to fix it. And she, she realized, okay, in my position, what does God want me to do here? She was used to doing that. Okay? She was used to saying, okay, what does God want me to do now? And she did it. And because she was used to doing it, and because she was used to saying, Oh God, help me, lead me, help me, teach me, Lord. And she wasn't just tuned into what I like and what I don't like, and I didn't like that. Okay? She was tuned in to God's Spirit helping her to do the right thing at the moment. And she became skillful at it. Beautiful situation. Abigail was asking herself, What is my responsibility before God? What is right for me to do? How does God want me to respond to this? Where Michael was caught up in what was appropriate for David to do, so he didn't embarrass or annoy her. Michael was caught up in, what do I want David to be like? How do I want David to act? What will people think of me if David acts like that? How can I let David know that I'm not pleased with his behavior? David is not lining up with what I think a king should act like. Did Michael ever stop and say, Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? No. She didn't do that. She decided, What do I want to do in this situation? She didn't stop and say, Lord, 
What do I do in this situation? Help me, teach me, lead me. If she had done that, she would have been, she would have been in a practice of doing that, and she would have been a great uh, figure in Scripture, like Abigail was. <clears throat> God did not give Michael the jurisdiction or authority to do what she did. And you say, well, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this, how, how do we know what is appropriate? God's law, God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. When's the last time you read it? When's the last time you meditated in it? When's the last time you read the Bible and said, God, teach me? I want to be all you want me to be. Well, then you're not going to know what to do when the crisis comes because you're not doing what you ought to do in normal life. If you're not practicing to live normal life, you're going to fail in the crisis time. I guarantee it. Yeah, the husband has a certain amount of responsibility in teaching the wife. Okay? But the wife, her responsibility is not in the realm of correcting and teaching. It's the realm of encouraging in the right direction. The influence. Encouraging him in the right direction. Giving him information he may not have had. Abigail turned David totally around. But she never was commanding. She never was demanding. She said, David, I know that you are what you're doing. I know that you feel justified and we are guilty of, of, of wrong here. But because of what God has for your life, because of the plan God has for your life, and the high calling on your life, I don't want this situation to hinder you in God's work for you. I'm afraid what you're planning to do, you will look back on, and it will be a regret to you, and it will hinder your relationship with God, and it will hinder your success for God. And David's like, whoever cared for me like that? Whoever, whoever told me that they believe that God is going to establish me king and God has high things for me and they're afraid about my actions that it might hinder me in my success. Whoever cared for me like that? And he was totally aghast. And all he could say was, Blessed be the Lord that sent you to meet me. And blessed art thou. And when, he, when, when she met him, he had blood in his eyes. He had a sword on his side, and he was going to take out the whole bunch. Do you see the power? But it wasn't the power of authority. It was the power of influence and wisdom. In 1 Corinthians 7.29, Paul says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep, as though they wept not. And they that rejoice, as though they rejoice not. And they that buy, as though they possess not. And they that use this world, as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passes away. The idea was, guys, you're called to tend the garden. You're called to do God's business. Don't be distracted from that. Don't let your wife veer you off course. You take the reins and leave your home for the glory of God. But you make sure that you're in line with God and you realize when you buy, don't get caught up in what you bought. Everything in this world should be geared to pleasing the author, okay? And tending the garden his way and producing a garden that he will say, well done. And the wife, you can't, you can't because you got ideas or, or desires. I want to do this or I want to do that. You can't veer your husband away from that. And the husband can't allow himself to be veered away from that. Okay? He's got to maintain that focus. She needs to get in line and help him to fulfill that focus. You are the servant of God. Eve is on loan to help you do God's business, but she is not... Uh, God's um, she is not your life okay she is God's and God has entrusted her to you as her leader and protector not to distract you not to abuse not to be your slave no God wants a nice garden 
That means a home and a life in order. That means the wife is properly in her position, but she's properly treated as well. Okay? Otherwise, your garden's out of order. If your wife is not, I mean, if you're an able, you don't have the garden God wants. Your wife, may God, God may bless her in spite of you, but you're not going to be okay when you face it. I remember a cartoon I saw one time. This little old hunched over man and his wife next to him had her hand on his head talking to one of her friends and she said, when I married him, he was an unmanageable six foot four. She had him all broke down into his place by that time. Husbands, the fashion of this world passes away. And then what? Is your garden? It's going to be graded. Is it what God wants it to be? That includes how you've tended the garden, how you've tended your children, how you've tended your wife. And wives, a lot of the success of this garden depends on what kind of helper you've been, what kind of influence you've been. When you came in flowing into this relationship and this life, what type of influence did you give? When Eve came into the garden, Adam was filled with joy, but what kind of influence did she give after a while? She destroyed the whole thing. Let me ask you two questions and we're about done. <clears throat> Number one, do you subject your wife to your plagiarism or to the author? Do you subject your home to plagiarism or to the author? You need to answer that question honestly before God. Wives, do you subject your husband to Abigail or Michael? Are you an Abigail or a Michael? And the third question to both of you, do you really think you can fill these roles without humble, earnest, daily prayer? Most are too willing to wing it. I guarantee you, you will blow it. You will fail, 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 fail. Unless you daily are in prayer concerning this. Unless you're in touch with the author. Unless you're an extension of the author, husbands. You are enable and will be designated as such by God. Okay? Wives, unless your influence is the influence of the Holy Spirit in the home. Full of the Holy Ghost and you're inflowing into the home it is the Holy Spirit's influence and not just your uh, Michael feelings. You will fail unless you are daily, earnestly praying to these ends. You're not gonna you're not gonna get by on your looks, honey. You're not gonna get by on your muscles, fella. It ain't gonna work. Too many have failed there before. Let me read something to you and then we're done. In Proverbs 31, 25, we have the description of the Proverbs 31 woman. But I want you men to understand this same idea applies to you as well in your own realm. It says, strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor, good looks, or a, a, a sweet smile is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. I want to uh, present to you or, or bring out the idea that Michael and Abigail were probably both beautiful women. But one was beautiful and one was ugly in another realm. Okay? And if Michael was more fair than Abigail, Abigail surpassed her in spirit 
And that meant a lot more to David than Michael's pretty face. This is what I read in Proverbs 31. It's the same with the man. Will your children rise up and call you blessed? Will your children rise up and say, My dad was the best illustration of the author I know of. I know that my dad was an extension or striving to be an extension of the author. That was his passion in life. That was his drive. That's what he worked for, to be an extension of the author and not a plagiarist. Will your children rise up and call you blessed mama because the influence they felt was the breath of God in the home? See, that's a high calling. You better believe it. It's your calling. You say, Brother Mark, I don't know that I can do that. No, you can't. That's why you better be on your face daily. That's why you better be in the Word daily. That's why you better repent and turn and humble yourself because you will not be an Abigail by accident. The natural man will be a Michael in your life, not an Abigail. You'll be a plagiarist, not an not extension of the author through natural means. If you're going to be an extension of the author and have the influence of God, it's got to come from God through you. It won't come from you. Let's stand together. I want to submit to you this morning that the Bible has all the answers. You got to, you got to dig them out. You got to find them. You got to listen to them. The Bible has the answers to all of your family problems. I've given you the basic foundation this morning. If everyone in here this morning would just apply themselves to what I've said this morning. Family problems would be solved. Any thoughts from the brethren before we pray? Well, you mentioned it about Michael. Where did she get her example from? What it came to be from her father. I think David understood that. And he hit it right on the head. When he said it was before the Lord who chose me above your father right. and all his house. But we all have raising, we all have backgrounds, we all come from families, and we have presuppositions of what things ought to be like. Right. But then, when you come, and especially if you come into an environment where God's blessing is, there's other people who are godly. Why did you come into that? It's because where you came from was at a lower level. So don't bring your presuppositions as to how this now ought to be. You know, we can see it. It's foolish for Michael to think that David ought to behave like Saul when God had rejected Saul and chose David. But don't bring your ideas from a lower environment, bring it into a higher environment and think, now everybody here should behave like this. You know, everybody here shouldn't behave the way I was raised because the way I was raised was Paul. Yeah, and, and did she stop and think about that? No. She assumed that her perception was, I mean, from all that she could see, I'm right, it's clear, it's plain, I've evaluated correctly, therefore I'm going to open my mouth. And in reality, she was totally wrong. And humility would not have been so presumptuous. Humility would have said, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? And the Spirit of God would have said to her, it's not your situation. Nobody gave you, nobody set you in a place to tell David how to be king. That's my, that's my job. You do your job. It would have saved her if she had just stopped and asked. These same principles apply in every area of authority and any area you're under authority. Right. And so it, this sermon can do us good in many areas other than just in a marriage situation if we can understand that and then take
take it into those other realms. The principles apply, the plagiarism applies, the influence applies, the extension of the, all the, everything should be, every authority is an extension of the ultimate authority. Sometimes the extension course is longer to get to you, and sometimes they're higher on the list, and it's a little bit bigger they get it before you. But in every area of leadership, in church roles, and government roles, this is the pattern that God set up and right. the true principles that apply. It just makes it real difficult when one or the other gets out of balance. It requires for it still to work and for one part to still be right when one part is not right. It requires an extra amount of care and carefulness in that other part to make it very difficult for them, even though it's still possible. Yes. Yes, and just because just because the person we're meeting and dealing with is not powerful or able to kill us, is it not right to approach it with the same wisdom and care? We take we take advantage of situations because we're not going to be killed. Michael had no fear of being killed. So she didn't take the care that Abigail took. But I think if Michael was placed in Abigail's situation, she would have failed because she was not used to growing and working in that realm. Abigail had a reputation of being a woman of understanding before the crisis. There's so much, there's so much in there. I, I, I uh, challenge you to meditate on these situations. Meditate on it. Think about it. Realize that God wrote this down for our admonition. Let's pray.